Okay, so hello everyone. Do you think everybody who wants to be here is here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to see with the door. If it's too loud, you just get up and, and close it during the lecture, yeah? Um, yeah, so I'm recording the lecture and put it on the media site website of, of Uva if you want. I mean, I don't have to do it, but it might be convenient for you to review things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you have, ah, yeah, I need to get to know you a little bit, of course. I know Simon and Noe because you can say a little bit about yourself to the yeah. others. So we are working uh, in Florian Group on the reactor experiment, and I'm working on the Ruby Rails function experiment. And Noe is working uh, with. Uh, uh, I'm working on the continuous atom laser, and so we are just here for uh, some uh, more acknowledgement. <laughs> <laughs> and we are uh, both master students from France. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Know. And your school has this nice program where you can just choose in another lab in Europe and go there. And like, which year of your studies is it? It's between the first year of master and the second year of master. Nice. Mm -hmm. It's like bonus year. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and let's learn a little bit about you. Jonna, I know, of course. Mm -hmm. So we're all uh, master students here. All three of you are on this experimental track this year. Yeah, I heard that there is uh, overlap with theory courses and several theory students couldn't join our course because of that this year. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I never had such a low attendance in this course. It's crazy. So we even have overlap with Amet courses as well. Yeah, that's out of our control. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And what's your name? I'm Theo. I'm mm -hmm. from Greece. Mm -hmm. Also from Amet track. So first year, the second period. Uh, I don't know what else uh, to say. <laughs> you just came from Greece to Amsterdam for this master's yeah. year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice, yeah. Yeah, I remember a few good students uh, over the years who joined from Greece. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you? Uh, my name is Luis, I'm from Luis. Barcelona, and also I'm at the oh, I suggest I arrived this no, year. I was here last year. For the well, bet bachelor's. Mm -hmm. no, oh, you uh, made a theory. I master. started the master's in the theory track. Mm -hmm. this year I oh, you, you make two first year masters then, yes? Uh, mm -hmm. Last year I didn't get many C's because mm -hmm. well, I, didn't, I didn't even try to be honest. Mm -hmm. And uh, but enough to realize that I didn't want to do theory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this year I'm almost starting from scratch. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You have to go to the lab and see if you like working uh, uh, there. Mm -hmm. Yone, you know all about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um. So Jora, of course, introduced you in general uh, to this course already. It's kind of split in two with the theory part on Bose-Einstein condensation. Yeah, interactions between atoms and things like this by Jora and my part on how you actually do it in the lab. Of course, we are not in the lab here, so I'm telling you still the theory behind of how you do it in the lab. Yeah, and a little bit I mix in the technology on how things are done. But that's for next uh, time on Wednesday. Today is just like a one hour colloquium style overview where we see everything that I want to treat during the whole course but with a bird's eye view perspective and how I would explain it to, yeah, um, an outsider kind of. Um, and then we we go to the lab in the second hour today. And, yeah, you can show your experiments too, yeah? <laughs> yeah, we show you around. And it's really starting hardcore on Wednesday. <laughs> Good, so let's have fun. Making and probing Bose condensed gases. So, okay, now my pointer has to go over here again. Good, here, ah, yeah, overview of the course today. We just have fun with colloquium style introduction lab tour. Then I'll start with atom laser interactions, Bloch sphere, and things like this, uh, the next few lectures until we arrive. I mean, we have then here in lecture four, all the th theory that we need uh, to describe atom-light interactions in our hands. And then we use this 
to derive the um, yeah the functioning principles or describe how we laser cool atoms and how we trap them. And then we dive into the technology behind our experiments a little bit to finally be able to make a BEC. And then the last lecture, we will characterize the BEC. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's uh, start here. ultra cold quantum gases, what are they? Why do we want to make them and how do we create them? So, oh yeah, <laughs> you can look all of this up in books. Uh, there's a little bit of the um, public materials like these noble lectures I put, I will put on the uh, on the UVA website, but um, you can have also these books in the library, for example. Okay, so what is an ultra cold quantum gas? So what, what is ultra cold? Let's uh, write down a thermometer here. And you see, I used a logarithmic scale. Let's plot a few things here. What's the hottest things humans have made? What do you think? Like the That's right. Yeah, exactly. The quark gluon plasma here at 10 to the 12 Kelvin. And then in everyday life, perhaps the hottest object you may see every single day. Yeah, the sun, the inside of the sun is a million Kelvin or so. And then V here, of course, like 300 Kelvin. And if you use normal fridges, I mean, even the most powerful, but normal fridges, dilution fridges, you can go down to a few 10 millikelvin. But this is way too hot for us. We are going to a micro Kelvin and below. Yeah, even half a nano Kelvin has already been reached. And if you look at this, this is pretty extreme here. The odd number of orders of magnitude between us here in everyday life and our ultra cold atoms, yeah, five, six orders of magnitude. This is yeah, the same here, or nearly the same here between the inside of the sun and, uh, and us. I mean, the inside of the sun is roughly as hot for us as we are for, our, I mean, we are hotter for our ultra cold atoms and the inside of the sun is for us. It's pretty extreme, isn't it? And it's also nicely symmetric. You can, can go down by like nine orders of magnitude from everyday life to the ultra cold atoms, or you go up by uh, nine orders of magnitude to go to LHC. So humans are, I mean, how do you learn stuff? You just push the limits, you go to extremes and it can be extreme energetic to have a, like a microscope into particles, but you can also do the opposite and cool down as much as you can naively would think cooling down, everything freezes, it's boring, it's just a crystal, nothing happens, but not true. This is only true in classical physics. As you might know, from say Heisenberg uncertain principle, if you if you know the location of a particle, you don't know the momentum. So if you freeze things out, it doesn't kind of move anymore. Not true. I mean, because of Heisenberg, it moves a lot. So as soon as you 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 cool down stuff, all the boring classical random thermal motion goes away, but the quantum behavior is still there, and it becomes only apparent if you take away the boring classical motion. So that's. It's not, not so much single particle physics, really, it's many particle physics, the interaction of many quantum particles with each other that we want to explore and exploit to build cool stuff. Now, um, okay, now here, another few illustrations of what's going on. Of course, we start in the lab at normal conditions, like every day, like 300 Kelvin, 400 Kelvin, something like this. And we yeah, typically get a gas of atoms by say heating rubidium up to like plus 100 degrees Celsius. So you have a vapor of individual rubidium atoms and they whiz around with hundreds of meters per second velocity and we somehow cool them. So yeah, initially yeah, they're as fast as, a, as an airplane. It's normal because they go roughly as fast as the molecules in air. I mean, that's what it means to be below the speed of sound. And and then we cool the atoms down. And at some point, our normal classical description of particles 
saying that we know x, y, z, the position of the particle, and vx, vz, vy, um, I mean, the velocity of the particle, both perfectly symbolized by this dot at a very specific location and the arrow with a very specific direction and length, this language cannot be used anymore because of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Yeah, if you delta x, delta p must be bigger than h bar. And if you cool down, the uncertainty in your momentum goes down. Yeah, if you are at zero Kelvin, you have no motion. Delta p is zero, so delta x is infinite. Yeah, but we can't, can't of course, go that down. The closer you go to zero, the bigger, uh, the smaller and smaller delta p becomes the bigger and bigger delta x must be. And this is why this language just completely breaks down. So we need to switch over to the language of quantum mechanics to describe the motion of these particles. And that means we need to write down some wave function, which gives you everything that you can know about the particle. And certainly not momentum and position at the same time. But what it gives you is like, this is a complex function over space, absolute value squared gives you the probability distribution to find the particle sum here. Fourier tra transform absolute value square, you find the momentum uh, distribution of your particle, yeah? Good, and it just happens so that this wavelength here, it's called the Dupuy wavelength, that um, of course increases if you lower the temperature. I mean, the mom yeah, okay. I, I guess you heard that somewhere, yeah. Here we are typically speaking of the thermal de Broglie wavelength, so the temperature average de Broglie wavelength, not necessarily the one of a single particle, but yeah. Okay, so we cool down further and these waves become bigger. The de Broglie wavelength becomes bigger. And at some point, the de Broglie wavelength exceeds the average interparticle spacing. And now, if you used identical bosons as your atoms, then these waves will synchronize with each other. Yeah, that happens once the atoms are as fast as snails, actually racing snails, like ten, they exist, yeah, <laughs> 10 centimeter per second or so. <laughs> and then um, they can synchronize with each other and all populate the lowest energy state that you may have. I mean, typically your gas is confined in some kind of box, in some kind of trap, harmonic trap, for example. So there are energy levels in there and typically they will go to the lowest state and then start to macroscopically occupy this lowest state. Yeah, it, it's also, it, it's called a condensate. Why? I mean, condensation, you know it from everyday life. If you have air, with water molecules inside the air. If you put more and more and more water molecules into the air, at some point the air can't hold these water molecules anymore and they will condense out on the coldest spot of your walls, yeah? And this is the same here. That's where the name comes from. We could think of stuffing more and more and more atoms into your system. Let's say starting with a system which, which doesn't have yet a condensate. Now I'm stuffing more and more atoms at this temperature into my box, which means that the distance between the particles decreases. And at some point, the particles will be closer than the Dupuy wavelengths. And what happens now? Uh, Einstein and Bose, I mean, first Bose and then Einstein translated it to atoms. They, they showed that it's impossible to have these additional particles that you stuff into your system just freely flying around in the box because there are simply no quantum states available anymore that they could possibly occupy. And the only solution for these particles is to cluster, to all accumulate in the lowest energy state. And so that's really like condensation. You stuff water into air and at some point it doesn't work anymore and you get a water droplet. Here it's the same. You stuff more and more atoms in, some point it breaks down and, and the only thing you can do is get, get a condensate. And if we then imagine we cool even more um, the Dupuy wavelength increases and more and more atoms will enter the condensate and less and less atoms will be in these higher occupied uh, modes. And uh, at some point we just cannot detect anymore any atoms in the higher lying modes. And then we call it a pure BEC, even if it's a bit relative to your detection method, of course, yes. 
Um, okay, so that's a Bose-Einstein condensate. All atoms described by the same quantum wave. And as Jor shows you in the theory, now people typically just describe the BC wave function on its own. This is the so-called cos pitayevsky equation, which he will introduce to you if he hasn't done so yet. And, and the thermal gas on top of it, you, you have just kind of mostly just two different theories. For well, this is a simple Bose distribution, very simple. And this here needs to be described as a cos pitayevsky equation. Why is that? It's because the atoms are quite close to each other, quite dense, and typically they feel each other, and typically they repulse each other, and it's, it's actually then looking a little bit like a liquid. I mean, it's it's kind of a hydrodynamic equation with non-linearities, yeah. And you can study hydrodynamic phenomena in BECs. Good. Okay, so now you know what we are talking about, but you don't perhaps know really why we should bother. Yeah. So let's talk about this. So for me, the main goals of ultra cold atoms and quantum gases are to gain fundamental insights into quantum physics and also to build quantum devices that use quantum effects to do things that you just couldn't do at all using the laws of classical physics. And these need to be, of course, useful things, yeah. Okay, let's give, let's study examples of these two things. So fundamental insights is understand quantum materials, quantum many body physics, superconductivity, and lots of other fancy stuff. And quantum devices, that could be clocks or atom interferometers for the measurement of gravity or gravity gradients or gravitational wave detectors or such things, yes? Okay, let's dive a little bit deeper into these two topics. So first, fundamental insights. Um, so here we are exploiting that with ultra-cold atoms, we very easily have many, many atoms with decent degree of control over our atoms. So we, we can study many body physics. So what's that? So if you, in autumn, look at the sky, you see these flocks of birds, yeah? And um, it's, they make these beautiful patterns and it's not like there is one master bird that tells every other bird what to do. It's really they just feel each other's motion, see each other, I don't know, and and then adjust each a little bit their flight pattern, and they seem never to collide, but stay together and make these fancy, fancy swirls. And this is an emergent phenomenon. This is something which we have all over nature. Um, we, we can very well describe like standard model of particle physics, quantum chromodynamics, quantum electrodynamics, describe what the particles do, but you don't necessarily learn from that how atoms work. And from the atoms, you go one level higher, you get chemistry and, and from there you get biology and, 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 and perhaps sociology and history and so on. And every level of science has its own language to describe their phenomena of interest, yeah? Even, yeah. They, they don't necessarily have to go back down to the standard model of particle physics to derive uh, like insights about human psychology. And um, yeah, so this is emergent. So we can well describe an individual bird here and, and even model it in a computer with a simple model. And then out of these simple equations, without us evidently being able to predict this up in issue, we see, wow, there are these uh, phenomena arising which deserve um, a description in their own right and can be described. Uh, it's like an object which you have here, this flock of birds with its own behavior. Yeah, and, and that happens, of course, also in quantum mechanics. And it's very interesting because you get surprises there and you can use it for many things. Yeah. So an example are superconductors. Of course, we know there are lots of electrons in there, but why? Can these electrons somehow together form a superfluid that a charged superfluid that pu pushes magnetic field lines out and then leads to levitation, for example? So these electrons they need to somehow correlate. Correlate just means they have to adjust or they do automatically adjust 
uh, their motion to the motion of the other electrons in a complicated way, their relationships between the motions of electrons. For example, in the simplest low temperature superconductors, which have been un understood since decades, um, two electrons with opposite momenta pair up in a so-called super Cooper pair. Now electrons are fermions, but if you fermions are half spin, half integer spin particles. If you put two together, you get a single or triplet. So you have a, a zero or one spin. So it's a boson suddenly. So they can both condense. And then if you, if you have a both condensate, you have a superfluid. It can flow without uh, resistance up to a certain velocity. So um, that's behind all of this. Now, there are other superconductors like the high temperature superconductors, which are quite poorly understood. I mean, we know roughly how, how they work, but not, not very well. And it has been a driving force in our field and also in solid state physics to try to get to the bottom of high temperature superconductors with the hope that if we ever would understand the mechanism, we could leverage this to make better superconductors that perhaps work at the room temperature and make energy transmission free of loss or, or something like that, yeah. But that's just one uh, example in where intricate quantum motion of the electrons gives uh, rise to amazing macroscopic behavior. There are many more examples. Okay, now we want to, to learn about this. We want to describe this. And of course you could say, no, I'll write down the Schrodinger equation and solve it. No big deal, isn't it? Okay, let's try. Uh, but let's first try with a simplified system. Yeah, Instead of using particles that move through space, which is already a pretty complicated Hilbert space, I use the simple Hilbert space that I can think of. And the simple Hilbert space of all is a two state level Hilbert. One state is of course completely boring. So let's, let's take two quantum states. Let's call it a qubit, just two states, yes? And then you can have superposition states and so on. Um, and and yeah, it's zero or one, or arrow down, arrow up, yeah? Okay, now to start with, let's let's just take the classical version with it, which is arrow down, arrow up, or zero or one. And then I take a few of them, yeah? Now let's just consider um, how difficult it is to describe this system with a classical computer. And I'm not even going to bother trying to describe the dynamics of the system. I'm just simplify here to the max and only ask the question, how difficult is it to store the state of the system in the memory of this classical computer? Yeah, and for this system here, classical, zero ones, it's obvious. There's a direct mapping from this to the memory of a computer. For n particles, you need n bits and that's it. Okay, let's make the switch over to the classic, uh, to the quantum world. Can you tell me, let's see, um, let's imagine we have n quantum bits. How much memory do you think I need to store the information? To the yeah, two to the n. Can you explain why? Well, because for each one of them, Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. And you have two to the n possible combinations, yeah? So if I plot it, it looks like this. Clear to you? Yeah. So, um, and also there is something else going on here. I used just bits, zeros or ones. The memory I need here suddenly is filled with complex numbers, yeah? This is way more complicated. I don't even know how, how many digits after the dot I have to store in the memory to still have a high enough fidelity to, to store my quantum state, yeah? I have no idea. And this is, by the way, uh, a big difference now between quantum, yeah, okay, no, okay, sidetrack. Big difference between classical and quantum computers. Classical computers are auto-correcting, yeah? If zero and one is represented by five volt and zero volt, you just say um, uh, one is every, every voltage above four volt and zero is every voltage below one volt. If your voltage is five volt or 4.5 volt, it just doesn't matter, it's always one. No such thing for a quantum computer. You need to store these complex numbers precisely. Otherwise uh, you mess up, it's not the same quantum state anymore. Now, how precisely, yeah, that depends on, on your algorithm and the stuff you want to do with the quantum computer, of course. And, and that's where error correction comes in and stuff like that. Okay, now, but okay, so what, now we learned we need two to the n complex numbers to describe this quantum system of n qubits. 
Is this a lot? Yeah, let, let's see. So let's just take the most powerful supercomputer in the world, at least from last year when I made the slide. <laughs> Didn't look it up this year. Um, yeah, so it's this one, Fukago, Riken, and we are interested in this memory. 480 petabyte of RAM. Sounds impressive. But let's uh, take the logarithm of this and, and just take a normal encoding or floating point numbers you usually use. And then you can count 56 spins or qubits. Yeah, you say not very much, um, not so nice, but it doesn't matter because classical computers make really fast progress all the time. No, uh, we just wait a little bit and then it's, this problem will be solved, no? Okay, let's fast forward into the ultimate classical computing future. We use every single atom of the visible universe to store one complex number in the atom. So we, we have 10 to the 80 atoms in the visible universe. Sounds like a lot, no? <laughs> so how many, so 10 to the 80 complex numbers. So how many qubits is this? Not very much. It doesn't help us at all, yeah? There's no big difference between 56 or 270. It's both small, relatively small numbers. Yeah, and that's not even speaking about calculating anything. It's just storing the quantum state. So this is hopeless. It doesn't work. You cannot use a classical computer to describe every quantum system, especially the most interesting ones are out of reach. And they are the most interesting ones because they are out of reach. Otherwise, it would be trivial, of course, yeah. <laughs> um, so the difficulty lies, lies in the entanglement of the system. You just can't wreck this apart, these, these spins. So the uh, obvious solution is to use a quantum computer because its Hilbert space is, of course, the one which we just discussed here. So uh, Hilbert space of a quantum computer grows exponentially with the number of qubits, just like a quantum system's complexity grows with the number of particles, whatever they may be. Yeah, great. But yeah, we don't have a good quantum computer, nor do we have good quantum algorithms. Yeah, we have two, three little algorithms here and there for yeah, factorization of prime numbers for cryptography breaking. Yeah, I changed my cryptography algorithm, go away from factorization of prime to elliptic curve encoding, blah, blah, blah. No quantum computer, as far as we know, can crack that. So not so useful. Um, optimization problems, they might perhaps be useful, especially in quantum chemistry, but okay. Um, very limited today. So a more near-term solution and much more flexible and much more fun, uh, at least if you're an experimentalist, are quantum simulations. Because we know how to create a decently well-controlled quantum system in the lab. And then we just need to entice it to obey the rules like the Hamiltonian of the system that we are interested in. And this is just the same as if you want to um, you have the plan system of planets around the sun, Newton's laws, you build an orrery. It maps one to the other. Yeah, it's an analog computer. And yeah, mm -hmm. they're quite powerful. I mean, when computers were first developed, I mean, it wasn't so clear cut if digital or analog computers would win. They were very powerful analog quantum computers used in the 1920s, 30s and so on. Mm -hmm differential equation solvers and so on. And now it's the same with quantum computers. It's it's pretty much like we are building analog quantum computers if we build quantum simulators instead of going to the full control that's needed, this error correction and so on that's needed for digital quantum computing. Good, so what can we do with it? So I said, we do have this difficult to study quantum system. Of course, theorists have thought about these systems since decades. They know how to write down uh, simplified Hamiltonians of which they believe that they capture the essential physics of these complicated systems. So for example, I mean, in solid state, whatever, uh, yttrium barium copper oxide, yeah, superconductor, you could in principle take into account 
the exact Coulomb potentials that every electron experiences in the iron core potentials of every atom. But theorists don't really do this. I mean, some, but most often they just say, oh, they're just wells and the electrons can hop from well to well. And if, this, if two electrons are sitting in the same well, they have Coulomb repulsion. And that's it. It's called the Fermi Hubbard model. Yeah. And one thinks that the simple so called Fermi Hubbard model describes high temperature superconductors. It's not proven, but it's very likely. Um, yeah, and the thing is, we cannot, with our ultra cold atoms, directly map every little itsy bits uh, detail of a, um, uh, a complex many um, solid state material. But we can very precisely implement these models, perhaps even more precisely than the models uh, realize the condensed matter physics model the system. So we do have these well-controlled atoms and we can make a lattice potential and we can have these atoms hop from lattice well to lattice well and they act with each other only if they are on top of each other and so forth, yeah. Now, what's even more cool about that is that our quantum model that we implement doesn't even have to be inspired by a real solid state material. More often than not, it's simply inspired by a theoretical concept like topology. Yeah, no topology a little bit, yeah. And um, so, yeah, we, we, can, we can really implement these fancy Hamiltonians that theorists can write down of which, which they are interested in because in theory they have these cool properties, but we don't know if they have anywhere a realization in nature or in a crystal that you might bake in an oven. Okay, and why can we do this nice quantum simulation, it's because we have such good control of our ultra cold atoms and also trapped ions like in René Gerrit's mass lab. So we can nearly arbitrarily design the potential through which the atoms are moving. We can tune the interactions between the atoms. We can play around with the internal states of the atoms and much, much more. And we just need to, we always, it's not never perfect. There are always artifacts, stuff that we don't want, especially loss processes. And we just need to, to be skillful and create a situation where the losses are not so important and the effects that we want are dominating. Okay. And of course, if you, if you have such a nice potential here and you have the atom in the ground state of this little harmonic oscillator well here, the atom needs to be cold. Only then you have tunneling from one potential well to the neighboring po potential well through the step barrier. If the atoms were hot, they would just thermally fly around here and it would be boring. No quantum behavior. So we need ultra cold atoms. Okay. So that was this branch here. Let's go to the other use of ultra cold gases. Quantum devices, for example, clocks. Okay, so what's a clock? Um, for a clock, you need a pendulum. I mean, a, you need a frequency reference and classically that would be, for example, a pendulum. Now, if you only know about classical physics and you build clocks based on normal pendulum, if you want to build a second clock, you have to build yet another pendulum, but that's a human-made macroscopic object. If you build a second pendulum, it will not have exactly the same length, exactly the same mass. And therefore, it will not have the same oscillation frequency and you will never be able to build two clocks that tick at the same frequency. Now you may calibrate it if you can bring the two clocks to the same location and compare, but even then that's only possible up to some degree. And then typically this human made uh, reference pieces consist of many, many atoms. So typically they suffer from thermal expansion and other environmental influences and, and they just change over time. Okay, luckily we live in a quantum world and we can use the quantized energy levels to provide us with a frequency reference. Namely the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation that you have to send onto your atoms to excite an electron from one of these levels to another one. And these atoms, they are made by nature. As far as we know, 
all the atoms of a certain isotope are absolutely identical to each other. It would be a super duper discovery if we found out that this isn't the case. And, <laughs> and, and also these transitions here, we, we have a huge choice of transitions that we could use as the base of our clock. We can just try to choose transitions that, that are very narrow, that have a high frequency optical, for example, and that are very sensitive to what you want to measure. I mean, for example, if you want to measure magnetic fields, you would choose states that are very magnetic. If you want to measure the flow of time, you choose levels that are not influenced by magnetic fields or electric fields or non-magnetic states, yeah? And now our only task in building a clock is to not mess up, to, <laughs> to read out this transition frequency as precisely as possible without uh, shifting these two levels around too much. Yeah. And then if we don't, yes, if somebody here builds a clock and somebody in the US or somebody at the other side of the galaxy builds a clock based on, say, the strontium-87 millihertz transition between two, the two non-magnetic states that exist in this atom. This clock will tick this the same frequency. Yeah. No need to bring the two clocks together and compare the frequencies. Okay, um, so if we want to build a really good clock, as I said, we need a high transition frequency and narrow transition. Optical transition is just millihertz line, which is what's typically used. We want a large signal from our clock. So you want to use many atoms, but beware, don't let these atoms touch each other. If they did, they would influence each other on these um, levels would shift around, yeah? It messes up your clock. So that means you can't work with a solid chunk of metal, yeah, strontium piece or so. You have to evaporate these atoms. They have individual, say, strontium atoms flying around. But now remember, at room temperature, these atoms fly around with hundreds of meters per second velocity. And then you know about the Doppler effect. You car driving by, yeah. The same thing's happening with these atoms. And if an atom goes towards you, you will see the transition frequency of this atom shifted. That's bad. So we need to cool these atoms as much as we can essentially uh, to stand still. And now with the techniques we are going to learn about in this lecture, you are able to do this. And then you can actually trap these atoms essentially one by one in a so-called optical lattice like X in an egg box. And now the only thing remaining to build a clock is to read out this nice clock transition frequency. And you do this spectroscopically. You build a laser of which you hope that it has the correct frequency. You shine this laser onto these atoms. And if it, the laser has the correct frequencies, the atoms will be excited to the upper clock state and you can very easily see this, yeah. And, and then you're of course happy. Now lasers are really nasty. Shortly afterwards, the laser will have drifted away in its frequency by temperature changes, changes in the electric current going through the laser diode and whatnot, yeah? So uh, if you do this experiment a second time, your atoms may not be as well excited to the upper state as before. And you can easily see this and then you can play around with the frequency of your laser to figure out in which direction it has drifted off and pull it back to the correct frequency. And that's what a lock really is, a, a, a lock of a laser to uh, atoms and this output frequency, this laser is your clock signal. That's the tick tock of your clock. And it's just ticking at like 460 terahertz optical frequencies. And some people like that, like us, other people don't. <laughs> so those other people, they can just purchase an optical frequency comp to translate this high optical frequency into any other frequency they want, microwave, radio frequency, or another optical frequency. It's just like a 400,000 euros device, a little bit of pocket money, and then you're there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, cool. What can we do with such clocks? Such a clock goes wrong by one second over the lifetime of the universe. 
compare this to a quartz clock, one second over 30,000 years, was it? Yeah, something like that. This is massively better. And uh, what can you do with it? So, okay, did you watch the movie Interstellar? Yeah, so the astronauts go close to a black hole and the one who gets closer ages slower than the one in the spaceship, even if it's a little bit stupid how they did it in the movie, you know, with the guy going around a planet, it makes no sense. But in principle, um, the effect they want to point out to is uh, relativistic time dilation, yeah? If, if gravity is stronger, um, time flows slower so your feet age slower as your brain or you can think faster if you make uh, if you if you like this uh, than if you make a handstand so um now unfortunately we don't have a black hole near earth so we can't just go there and exp time travel and experience this in our own lives but we have these super duper clocks now people took two of these clocks and compared their relative frequency that's what's plotted here. They just me measured a few times, and this is the average here. That's the relative frequency between these two clocks. And then they took a forklift and lifted one of these two clocks up by 30 centimeters. And then they compared again. And you see, um, the measurement result is really different, just like predicted by a relativistic time dilation. And that was like 12 years ago. In the I mean, clocks since decades, since the 50s or even longer, get better by a factor of 10 every 10 years. So now we are at the level of centimeter changes. Yeah. And it will for sure go to millimeter scale soonish. Yeah. Impressive. And, and what else can we do? Yeah, we can try to answer the question, are the constants of nature really constant? So let's build two clocks, one based on strontium, one based on ytterbium. Now these are two different atoms. And if a constant of nature changes, we can actually analyze and, and predict which one of the two clock transition changes more than the other. And there can be vast differences and we know about that, yeah? So uh, examples of fundamental constants I'm talking about here is the electron to proton mass ratio. Two masses divided by each other is just a number without any units. So this is given by nature. That's part of the fabric of space-time. It's just as it is. And uh, or of the fine structure constant, one over one three seven dot blah, blah, blah. Yeah, just falls from the sky. It's given by nature. And we don't know why these numbers are as they are. Perhaps there are many universes out there in which it's not like this, but then you don't have atoms, and so you don't have conscious life, and then you can't see it. So that's the anthropologic uh, uh, principle, but uh, we don't know. And who says that these constants are constant? You just don't know. Um, they may not be. And if they just change very slowly, we still will live despite it being changed. Yeah. And if it changed suddenly and very much, uh, we would never know because we would just not be there anymore. And perhaps, you know, the multiverse theory it branches off into a into a, a universe where the vacuum uh, has decayed into a lower state and all these fun, uh, constants of nature are completely different. Yeah, we, we, of course, wake up in the other branch of the multiverse, of the quantum multiverse, where this didn't happen. So, yeah. <laughs> but, okay, it's allowed that these constants change a teeny, teeny, tiny bit and that could depend on, on, for example, the density of dark matter around us. Or it, it could depend on anything you want, really. I mean, the zeros are, they can always add another term to their Lagrangian or whatever fancy stuff, couple one thing with the other. If they're just the prefects, just a teeny, teeny, tiny numbers, tiny, tiny effects, we don't see this in everyday life, but we might be able to observe it with clocks. So you build these two different clocks and compare their relative frequency today, you get just a number, two frequencies divided by each other, it's just a number. And then you wait, say, a year or so and make this relative frequency measurement again. And if you see a difference between your two measurements, then you likely made a mistake. But if you didn't make a mistake, then you perhaps have observed um, a change in some of the fundamental constants of nature. Well, the big question is, of course, which one? Ah, then you need to build like dozens of these machines based on molecular transitions, all kinds of atomic transitions and so on. And you know you can predict which transition 
it depends more on this or that or the other fundamental constant. And then you can kind of triangulate from all these measurements, which ones of these transitions actually uh, change over time. And then you can say, oh, this theory is bullshit. Ah, this theory, mm, perhaps it's correct, yeah? So you can get kind of insights on new fundamental physics beyond standard model physics, but with machines on the millions of euros scale instead of the billions of euro scale. Of course, perhaps it's different complementary type of information that you get here compared to LHC. Yeah. And you can also measure other stuff like, does the electron have an electric dipole moment? Yes or no? Don't know. Standard model predicts it's teeny tiny, not measurable. Super string theory predicts we should have measured it already. So it's somewhere in between. Yeah. Good. And then there are also the societal applications. Obviously, uh, you are reasonably good atomic clocks on board of satellites uh, make it possible to send time stamping signals out to your cell phone so, so that they can triangulate where you are. Um, and, and lots of other things. I mean, yeah. Underground exploration, mass distribution changes, groundwater level changes, magma chambers filling up, inertial navigation, terrestrial navigation. I mean, a whole litany of, of uh, societal applications are in reach of these machines. And uh, one of our tasks is to make these machines simpler, cheaper, better, push button, and so on. Yeah, Because one clock nowadays, if you order it from us and our partners across Europe, yeah, We'll, we'll charge you 2 million euros and you will have to employ the PhD student who built the clock at your company uh, with it to keep the clock operational. So nobody wants that. So we are we, are, we just got granted a new European project um, with which we, we will push it to the next level of miniaturization and automatization. Yes. So I hope now you know roughly why we are doing what we are doing. Now, how do we do this? So, um, yeah, let's explain it a little bit here, but then I can we can also just go to the lab and I explain it to you there. It's it's perhaps more fascinating to see it right away in the lab. I mean, um, just a tiny introduction. So we already know the condition for Bose-Einstein condensation is that the Broglie wavelengths must be bigger than the average interparticle spacing. Or you can also write it down like this. You see, this is how Einstein wrote it down. There's a quantity called the phase space density you may have heard of. Yeah, It is nothing else than the density times this de Broglie wavelength to the power of three. De Broglie, I mean, density is, of course, one over distance between the particles to the power of three. So what you have here is nothing else than de Broglie wavelengths divided by the distance between particles to the power of three. OK. so. And now to, to exceed this critical phase space density of 2.6 and get a Bose-Einstein condensate, we can, of course, two, do two things. We can push up the density or we can lower the temperature or we can do both, of course. Now, yeah, let's try just one way, pushing up the density. Let's take a steel bottle yeah, like from scuba diving, and we put gas there, and we crank up the pressure like crazy, uh, trying to get to BEC. Does this work? Um, yeah, I mean, mm, not that great. So, so a problem is that the atoms with which we love to play with, they are a bit sticky. They are not like noble gases. So uh, we love to play with simple atoms like noble gas shell plus one or plus two valence electrons because we can very easily manipulate these valence electrons with lasers and so on. So one very nice element with which we play with is lithium. Yeah, And uh, we evaporate it and, and let's say we fill a steel bottle with lithium gas and we push the hell out of the gas and compress it like in a diamond anvil cell or whatever. What happens then? The problem is that the true ground state at room temperature of our lithium is a solid chunk of metal. It's not a gas. And the atoms will find their ground state. How? Now, two atoms colliding with each other, nothing can happen. It's completely elastic like billiard balls. Nothing will happen there. But if three atoms collide with each other, then two of the three can enter a molecular bound state that liberates a lot of energy. 
this energy needs to go somewhere. Of course, partially it can go into the kinetic energy of the molecule, which suddenly is super fast. Um, but you have momentum conservation as well. You need to uh, have also momentum carried away in the opposite direction. And that is why you need a third collisional partner. So uh, I should have made these arrows different. These here, these velocities with which the atoms come in, they're like tiny little arrows, barely visible. <laughs> yeah. And then once the molecule forms, a huge amount of energy is released. And this molecule shoots away in one random direction with a huge velocity. And the third atom shoots away with the opposite, uh, in the opposite direction so that momentum is conserved. Yeah, so this is nasty. This is one of the nastiest things that we have always going on in our experiments. It's one of these losses which we don't like, which I mentioned before. Um, yeah, what can we do? We, we need to avoid that. Now, we have, luckily, there's one nicer thing about it. Look, the three body loss rate scales with the density squared. Why is this? Now, that if you have the problem of one atom has to encounter another atom in a gas. So how likely is it that one specific atom encounters any other atom in the gas? It's proportional to the density. If the density is higher, it's more likely. Yeah. Now you have two atoms that have collided. Now, how likely is, is it that these two atoms encounter a third atom in the same gas? It's again proportional to the density of the gas. So yeah, in, in the calculation of the probability of having three atoms collide with each other at the same point at the same time, you have the density of your gas entering twice. Okay, so it quadratically gets worse with increasing density. Or you can say it quadratically gets less severe if you lower the density. So actually, this is a completely wrong approach trying to get a quantum gas. You should not take a gas bottle and pressure the hell out of the gas. No, you should do the opposite. You should go to the low density regime so that this effect here is negligible. It still happens, but it happens on a time scale of more than one second, like 10 seconds or so. Yeah. Isn't it also what happens inside stars? Like high densities create quantum matter? Ah, yeah, yeah. In neutron stars, you have that. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. Uh, <laughs> there, there, it is right. In neutron stars, it's exactly this what I say, yeah. tell you not to do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I guess they also have a black hole. Uh, that, you know, it can collapse into a yeah. black hole, which would be if you go excessive. <laughs> yeah. Mm hmm. <laughs> Okay, so now we know we should not be excessive with the density and we can estimate or from experience, we just know how dense we can go and it happens to be on the order of 10 to the 14 atoms per centimeter cubed. Now, hmm, is this a lot? Is this not a lot? No, but compared to the density of air, 10 to the 19. Yeah, so it's five orders of magnitude less dense than the density of air. Why doesn't this happen all the time for air? Huh. Nitrogen, N2, O2. Yeah, it's just no chemical reaction. What should happen there? I mean, NO, hmm. you need a lot of energy to get that working. Um, yes, but yeah, for, for the elements we are typically working with, this is the limit. Good, let's plug this maximum density into the equation for the critical phase space density. And we get out of it that we need to reach a temperature between a micro Kelvin and 10 nano Kelvin, and that depends on the mass. So what, uh, good, yeah, let's let's try to push this the Broglie wavelengths up by tuning the mass. Which mass would you like? Which atom would you like to work with? Mm -hmm. Hydrogen atoms. And that's what people indeed did, yeah? So Jörg Weilhaven and uh, Daniel Kleppner at MIT, they were the two people pushing towards Bose-Einstein condensation and they used hydrogen because it makes your deploy wavelengths bigger. And yeah, it seemed like an easy approach at the time. So in principle, they just used cryostats 
and and they cooled it down and developed even evaporative cooling and stuff like this. Um, but it was only in 1999 or something like this that Daniel Klepper reached it. Yeah. And then the hydro it was a gigantic hydrogen Bose Einstein condensate deep inside a cryostat in a magnetic bottle, but not accessible. <laughs> you can't put laser beams into it. You can't do much with it. They saw that they had it, and that's it. And it was, of course, like four years after the first BECs with alkalis had been created. Yeah. So you see already here's a square root over the mass. So yeah, you can tune it, but it's not very powerful because of the square root. So let's uh, let's do it otherwise. Let's just keep the mass at whatever and try to get the temperature down. And for that, you can't do with normal cryostats. You need a completely different type of fridge. And that's the kind of fridge we are going to look at in the lab. So now let's see if I, I think, um, you know, I mean, there are these slides there and you can use the slides to, to look over what I'm going to explain to you. But Perhaps we should just go to the lab. We have whiteboards in the lab. I can explain you everything. And we see the stuff really right there. Okay, let's have a little break and walk over to the lab, yeah? yeah.